Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bird Migration, How We Know What We Know. This webinar is presented by Birds Canada and Quest Nature Tours as part of the Toronto Bird Celebration. The Toronto Bird Celebration is a month-long festival event of events that celebrates spring migration all throughout the greater Toronto area and through the magic of online Zoom presentations. The Toronto Bird Celebration would not be possible without the generous support of Birds Canada, TD Friends of the Environment Foundation, Koa Optics, Armstrong Bird Food, and Patterson Outdoor Advertising. I invite you to please use the Q&A function uh, during the duration of this evening. Um, any questions that come to mind, pop them in there because we have some time reserved at the end for a Q&A. And during that Q&A, we'll be doing a draw. Um, two lucky attendees will be going home, well, we'll getting, be getting a copy mailed to them um, of Rebecca's book. And with that, I'll turn it over to Justin Peter, Board of Directors member for Birds Canada, to introduce our guest for this evening. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Olivia. And uh, welcome to all of you, uh, all you bird lovers that are out there tonight. Uh, as uh, a member of the Board of Birds Canada and also as a Toronto resident, it's my pleasure to be involved with the Toronto Bird Celebration. Um, the biggest uh, sort of um, appeals for me personally, besides birds, is the chance to meet with other bird lovers, either in person or online. One of my other great pleasures of being involved with Front Bird Celebration is the chance to, um, to recruit, to look for interesting speakers and event leaders. And uh, I think today we'll have a, a, a I, I hope you'll find that uh, your, your participation here is um, very worthwhile and helps you learn a lot more about birds. I came across today's speaker, Rebecca Heisman, online, I believe that it was on Twitter, a place that I, I frequent sometimes on social media. And um, Rebecca is what you would call a definite um, bird nerd. I'm gonna introduce Rebecca in a second. I like to think we're all very interested in birds. Of course, today being Mar May 1st, sort of marks the symbolic uh, opening of the migration floodgates here throughout, uh, throughout Southern Ontario, especially. Um, tonight, our speaker will be discussing the mysteries of migration, what she's come to learn about them through her new book, Flight Paths. And that's what the book looks like here. And as Olivia just mentioned a few moments ago, we're going to have two copies of this uh, very recently released and very interesting book um, for two of you lucky participants at the end. So stick, stick around, please, till the end of this event to hear if your name is called. And of course, bird migration is, um, is fascinating. It's something we all enjoy, something that makes us um, feel better about having lived through the winter, for sure. It's something we look forward to. And today's uh, speaker, Rebecca, Rebecca Heisman, has taken her curio curiosity about uh, bird migration to another level. Uh, Rebecca Heisman is a science writer based in Eastern Washington State who loves nerding out about birds, as I said. She's contributed to many publications, including Audubon Magazine and Living Bird, which is the magazine of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. From 2015 to 2020, Rebecca worked for the American Ornithological Society, the world's largest professional organization for bird scientists. First as an independent contractor, helping to promote research published in the Society's scientific journals. And then as the first full-time communication staffer using social media, press releases, blog posts, and more to bring cool bird science to the broader scientific community and the public. It was there that she became intimately familiar with the North American ornithological community and got excited about the varied and wonderful methods out there for studying bird migration, something she's going to talk about much more tonight. How do we know what we know? Now, Rebecca was so inspired that she, in fact, left her job in 2020 with the goal of writing a book, which is this book, to showcase the amazing backstory of how we know what we know about bird migration. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I want to apologize if I'm a little bit froggy, I'm getting over a cold. And so I don't I don't normally sound quite this hoarse, but I've got my glass of water, so bear with me. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I have a PowerPoint. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Yes. Yeah. Let's see, is this going to work for me? Nope, nope, that's okay. Come on, just share a screen. Just do it the normal way. 
All right. Why is it telling you that I need to plug in? I'm sorry, guys. Hang on. All Screen. Right. There we go. Maybe. Oh. Yay. Okay. Take it away, Rebecca. <laughs> Thanks. Hang on. We'll be back. Uh, Rebecca, you're going to talk. You're going to talk uh, about your book and your stories, and then we're going to come back for a little discussion in a Q and A. During, yes. which, during which our participants or our registrants tonight can ask their questions. And uh, I'll relay those to you, Rebecca. And we look forward to learning more about migration and how we know what we know. Okay, so I finally got my PowerPoint working. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And as Justin said, I'm here because I am the author of a book that came out this spring on the history and science behind bird migration research. And I have spent the last several years of my life immersed in this topic. I have read more scientific papers than I can count. I have talked to dozens of scientists, not just ornithologists, but also a lot of computer scientists and electrical engineers and folks like that. I've got to join a few of them in the field while they've been doing their research. And it's just been a really immense privilege. I really love that my job is basically to tell stories about bird research because there's just so many good stories to tell. Here are just a couple of the really amazing migrators whose stories appear in my book. We've got the bar-tailed godwit on the left, which famously makes a nonstop flight over the Pacific Ocean from Alaska to New Zealand. We've got the bar-headed goose in the middle, which migrates over the top of the Himalayan mountains. And then on the upper right, that's a black pole warbler, which makes a nonstop three-day flight over the open Atlantic in fall. And that's a bird that weighs about the size, same, about the same as a ballpoint pen. So it's pretty incredible. As Justin said in his introduction, I, before COVID, worked for the American Ornithological Society, and I was their one-person communications department, so I wore a lot of hats. But a big part of my job was promoting new research that was coming out in their two journals, which you can see here. At that time, they were called the Auk and the Condor, although they've changed the names now. And so I was reading a lot of scientific papers and talking to a lot of researchers. And I was just fascinated by the methods being used in these studies. I didn't know or if I had learned in a college ornithology class, I had forgotten that you could study bird migration using weather radar or using uh, recordings of the calls of birds passing overhead or by analyzing hydrogen isotopes and feathers. And I just thought all of this was really cool and started wondering who figured this out and what's the science behind it. And the truth is I didn't really leave that job to write a book. I was, I was part of the statistic of all the millions of women who left their jobs around the start of the COVID pandemic because of childcare issues and other, other, thing, other increased responsibilities at home. But when that happened, I decided that I wanted to go ahead and turn this into a book proposal. And yeah, the result was the book that I'm here to talk about tonight. So when I was thinking about how to condense an entire book down into a you know, 30 minute, 45 minute talk, the book covers a lot of ground. I go from the origins of systematic bird banding in North America all the way up through high tech stuff like satellite telemetry and the latest, you know, genomic techniques and stuff like that. But I decided that the best way to turn this into an interesting talk would just be to zoom in on three of my favorite stories from the book. And so I'm going to share those three stories with you this evening. And I really hope that you come away from this with a new appreciation of all of the hard work and creativity that went into every sort of gee whiz fact that you hear about bird migration. So the first technique I'm going to talk about is one that I had not even heard of when I started researching this book, and it's called moon watching. So now we have weather radar and satellites and all, these, all this high tech stuff that can help us track what's going on with migrating birds. But before we had all of that, there was a guy who figured out how to study bird migration patterns on a large scale using just a telescope. So this guy's name is George Lowry. He was born in Louisiana in 1913, and he was interested in birds ever since from the time he was a young kid. He finished his master's degree in ornithology from the University of Louisiana, or excuse me, Louisiana State University in 1936. And he basically stayed on there for the rest of his career. He taught ornithology and he founded their museum of zoology. And this is just what he did with the rest of his life. Now, George Lowry, being really, really interested in birds and growing up on the coast of Louisiana, he would have been really familiar with the phenomenon of migratory fallout. 
which is when birds that are flying over the Gulf of Mexico, flying north in the spring, depending on the weather conditions, when they hit, sometimes they just basically drop out of the sky en masse at the first bit of land, the land that they see. <coughs> Excuse me. And at this point in time, in the early 20th century, most ornithologists thought it was pretty likely that birds did migrate over the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico on a regular basis, but it was really hard to prove it with the evidence that they had at the time. And then in the 1940s, another biologist named George Williams, I, I apologize for the two Georges in this story, we started with George Lowry and now we're on George Williams. He came along and said, basically, that can't be true. It doesn't make any sense. Why would birds voluntarily fly over the open water of the Gulf of, Mexi of, the Gulf of Mexico when Mexico is right there? Basically, he said, they must be going up the coast. They've got to be there. We're just not looking hard enough. Now, George Lowry, having seen the evidence of trans-Gulf migration on the coast with his own eyes, was really, really annoyed about this. And he started trying to think of ways that he might prove Williams wrong and prove that trans-Gulf migration was real. And he was sort of casting about for ideas and he remembered some sort of quirky ornithology papers from the early 20th century that he'd seen where people had described looking at the full moon through a telescope during migration and being able to see the silhouettes of birds passing in front of the moon. And he thought, okay, maybe I can do something with that. <coughs> Excuse me, again, I'm getting over a cold. So luckily for him, there was an astronomer working at LSU at the time who was also really into birds. And so Lowry and this astronomer put their heads together and they came up with some equations that would basically let Lowry take just a raw count of the number of birds that he saw passing in front of the moon in a certain amount of time and come up with, turn this into a standardized measurement that he called the migration traffic rate that he could use to directly compare the amount of migration going on at one time and place with the amount of migration going on at another time and place. So he thought, okay, this is perfect. I've got it. April 1945, George Lowry packs up his telescope and he gets on a boat headed across the Gulf of Mexico for the Yucatan. And he's all excited. The first night he sets up his telescope on deck and he points it out at the moon and he looks through it only to see that the moon is bobbing up and down and not staying in his field of vision. He was not experienced at sea and he had not anticipated this fact. There's no way he could get a good count of birds on the deck of this ship out on the open water. So he was undeterred and he waited until they crossed the Gulf of Mexico and docked in the Yucatan where the water was calmer and tried it again, set up his telescope on deck, pointed it out over the Gulf at the moon and counted 12 birds in about 45 minutes. That may not sound a whole lot, but when he put it through these equations that he'd come up with, what this worked out to was about 3,700 birds crossing over an imaginary one mile line extending out into the Gulf every hour. So he had basically just collected the first hard evidence that trans-Gulf migration was real. <coughs> Sorry, one sec. So he was excited about this, but he was also just getting started. He knew that he had hit upon a method that had a lot of potential for studying bird migration patterns across large scales. And so his next idea was that he was gonna scale this up and recruit a lot, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. There we go. Recruit a lot more people to start collecting this type of data all over the US. It was gonna be really hard to do it alone though. And luckily for him, a new grad student arrived at LSU right around this time. So this on the right here is Bob Newman. This is a photo of him taken Later in his career, when he was older, people don't really get a lot of pictures taken of them, it turns out, until they get famous when they're older. But so he was a young man arriving at LSU as a grad student. And George Lowry on the left and Bob Newman on the right formed a working partnership that would last all the way up until Lowry's death in the 1970s. Now, both of these men passed away quite a while ago, but I got to talk to some grad students who worked at LSU. And it sounds like in a lot of ways, they really couldn't have been more different. Lowry was sort of an old school gentleman naturalist who wore a suit and tie all the time, even when he was in the field. Newman approached problems a lot more like a modern scientist. He taught himself statistics at a time when that was not a common skill for zoologists. And he also had a reputation for his sense of humor. He really liked practical jokes. So these two men put their heads together and they came up with a scheme to, as I said, recruit volunteers from all over North America to collect moon watching data to try and get the first ever continent wide snapshot of bird migration patterns. Now this was before the internet. It was basically before computers. There might have been a handful of primitive computers in the US at the time, but these guys didn't have access to them. So what they did was they were spending 
literally 12 hours a day handwriting letters to potential participants all over the country, trying to recruit them to set up their telescopes in fall and collect this data. And eventually they were able to recruit 2,500 volunteers in 325 locations. And they were so concerned with making sure that the data they collected was as good as possible that they even went as far as publishing a how-to pamphlet about how to do this, including some helpful diagrams about how to make yourself comfortable while moon watching. Knowing that Bob Newman had a sense of humor and a thing for practical jokes, I can't decide if this figure from their how-to pamphlet was supposed to be funny or if it was just the 50s. I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, fall 1952, telescopes swing into action. People all over the continent are counting birds through their telescopes, sending in their data. As, let's see, as the data sheets start piling in and the paper data sheets stacking up higher and higher and higher on their desks, Newman and Lowry realize that they have another problem, which they probably should have given more thought to ahead of time, which is how to analyze the data. Again, no computers, no, you know, no computers to help them do the math. They have to calculate the average direction and volume of migration from these hundreds of locations. They have to look up weather data for these dates from each of these locations because they want to look for connections between bird migration and what's going on with the weather. They have to depict all of this on easy to interpret maps and they're going to have to draw these maps by hand. It took them 14 years. So in 1966, this paper finally comes out, a continent-wide view of bird migration on four nights in October. And it was just a total blockbuster. <coughs> It was 40 pages long and it included these beautiful maps like you can see here where they use these arrows in different colors to depict what was going on with migration in different locations. And nothing like this had ever really been done before. I feel like now it's easy to take this for granted, but no one before had ever been able to see what was going on with bird migration across the whole continent on a single night. And you could see how basically there were these big migratory movements spanning multiple states and that birds were riding advancing cold fronts. And now I think a lot of us know that who like to check the weather to see when the next big push of migrants was going to come through. But this was really groundbreaking at the time. Now, Lowry and Newman had plans to scale this up. They wanted to apply for a new grant to study the, to study the behavior of birds arriving off the Gulf, but this actually turned out to be the last moon watching paper they would ever publish. And I'm gonna to get to why in just a second. So a couple photos here. This is me on the left trying moon watching in my driveway. I saw one thing that might've been a bird. It's kind of harder than it sounds, it turns out. On the right, there are some folks who are trying to bring back moon watching by automating it using video cameras. And they're even trying to develop some machine learning tools to count the number of birds on their recordings. But all of Lowry and Newman's work was basically, as I said, about to be made obsolete by the rise of a new technology, which was radar. All right, so second migration story for you this evening. I'm gonna to try to get through these quickly so that we have plenty of time for questions. <coughs> this, of course, is an image from the National Weather Radar System, just like you see pictures from on the Weather Channel. And you can see a little bit of rain going on on the East Coast here. But all those big blobs going down the middle of the continent are birds. They, they filter those out when you, when you look at radar on TV for, for the weather. But birds show up really, really well on weather radar. The only reason they show up as round blobs is because each of those round blobs is the field of view of one individual radar station. And as birds lift off in the evening, there's so many of them that, that they just completely saturate that field of view. So radar, of course, first really came into use in World War II, and I'm going to get technical for just a moment here. Let's see. So the way radar works is it's basically like sonar or echolocation, except using radio waves instead of sound. It's, it sends out a radio wave, the energy bounces off objects in, the, in its path, it's reflected back, and the amount of energy that comes back tells you something about the objects that are out there. The basic principles of this had been worked out by the 1930s. And by the time World War II officially broke out, the English had already built a whole network of radar stations up and down the coast of England to give them an early warning of planes crossing the English Channel from the continent. Now, while all this was going on, this guy had been teaching secondary school science at a school in Devonshire in Southwest England. His name is David Lack. Again, he was a young man at this time. People don't seem to get a lot of photos taken of themselves till later in life. And he didn't know it yet, but he was about to become the father of radar ornithology. So David Lack had a background in ornithology. He'd studied birds at Cambridge. And in 1938, he took a year off 
from his teaching job to go study uh, Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. And he got back to England just as war was breaking out. And I want to read you a direct quote from a memoir that he wrote later about what happened next. I had become a pacifist at the age of 17. And in the autumn of 1940, I decided that I ought to leave my job at the school to work with a pacifist unit. I spent a trial night in the East End of London during heavy raids, but was so put off by the pacifist attitudes and so excited by the flashes and bangs that I was immediately converted from pacifism. A month later, the Central Register for Scientific Workers sent me to interview for an unspecified job. <coughs> As a biologist, you will, of course, have learned a lot of physics, the interviewer said. I'm afraid not, I answered. Well, I expect your math is of a high standard. I'm afraid not. Then very doubtfully, I fear this job will often entail going out in the wet and cold in the dark. Would you mind that? Not at all. So I was taken on and 10 days later set off from London with 19 other biologists on a mystery coach tour. It's always fun when you find out that the scientific, the historical figure that you're researching had a sense of humor. So I, I really appreciated that. So first lack was sent to the Orkneys, or sorry, let me back up for one second. Obviously you see where this was going, which is that lack was put to work on radar stations because apparently at this point they were putting anyone with any sort of scientific background in the UK to work on radar. So he was first sent to a posting in the Orkneys, which is a remote, wet, windy group of islands off the north end of Scotland. And I gather that Lack was the only person happy to be there because he got to spend all of his off hours birding and the birding there was really good. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. But after, shortly after that, he was reintroduced to an old colleague of his from Cambridge named George Varley, who was an entomologist, but who had now also fallen into the same line of work working on radar stations. Because again, anyone with any sort of science background is being put to work on radar. Varley introduced Lack to an issue with radar that he hadn't heard of before, which is that in addition to things that were obviously planes showing up on radar, radar operators kept seeing these weird signals that they couldn't figure out that sort of appeared and disappeared and changed direction at random. At one point, apparently, they urgently ordered fighter planes into the skies over the English Channel to check out some alarming signals, and they got up there and was nothing there. So the radar operators had started calling these angels, radar angels. Lack heard this description, and being an ornithologist, being familiar with the behavior of birds in flight, he pretty much right away was like, okay, those aren't angels, those are birds. It took him a while to convince people that this could possibly be happening, but he and Varley started working together to try and prove that yes, the radar angels were actually birds. They got pretty creative. At one point, they literally tied a dead gull to a balloon and sent it up into the air in front of a radar station to prove that a bird could at least in theory create a radar signal. In September, 1941, they finally managed to track a flock of gannets through a powerful telescope, like watching these gannets flying offshore in real time while also tracking them on radar. And so that was kind of the proof that yes, these signals really were birds in flight. There were still a lot of skeptics. It took the, again, it took them a long time to convince everyone. And I want to read you one more quote from David Lack, just because he was such a funny guy. At one meeting, after the physicists had again gravely explained the clouds of ions must be responsible, Varley with equal gravity accepted their view, providing that the ions were wrapped in feathers. So toward the end of the war, in 1945, they finally got permission to publish their findings, which had previously been top secret in the journal Nature. And this basically kicked off the whole subdiscipline of radar ornithology. After the war, of course, uh, radar very quickly got adapted for use by meteorologists as an early warning system for hurricanes and other big storms. And building a huge network of radar stations all over the US for weather was a huge boon to ornithologists because it meant that they had a way to collect large scale data on migration patterns very easily. <coughs> okay, sorry. Um, a few years ago, a paper came out that I think really captures the potential of what radar data can do. A couple of ornithologists associated with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology downloaded 150,000 individual radar scans covering each evening over 23 years. And they did some big data analysis with the computer to look for patterns connecting the amount of migration going on on any one night to what was going on with the weather. Basically the same thing that Lowry and Newman were trying to do with their moon watching data, except that now these you know, 21st century science had, scientists had access to a much bigger data set and a powerful computer to analyze this with. 
And they found that their math that they could do using the weather that was going on could explain up to 80% of the variation from one night to the next and how much migration was, would, would, would happen, excuse me. And crucially, they even found out that they could predict several days in advance when these big migratory flights were going to happen. So if any of you have ever used BirdCast, which is this really cool tool put out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where you can get on and see a forecast of how much migration is going to be going on in different parts of the continent on any one night, maybe less applicable for Canada. I'm, I'm looking at this now and realizing that it only shows the US, I'm sorry. But what this is based on is of course, the technology that David Lack originated. And so this is all thanks to a witty English teacher from Devonshire, or excuse me, science teacher from Devonshire. I've still got some brain fog from this cold, sorry guys. Of course, radar is not the only way that you can put radio waves to work studying bird migration. And that brings me to my last and favorite migration hero from tonight. So this guy is Bill Cochran. There's a photo of him as a younger guy on the left and later in life on the right. Bill Cochran was basically the father of wildlife telemetry, not just for birds, but for all animals. Any you know, radio collar put on an animal to follow where it, to follow where it's going. All of that goes back to Bill Cochran. In the 1950s, he was, or excuse me, yeah, late 1940s, he was a young Navy veteran working on an electrical engineering degree part-time while also working for a brand new TV station in Illinois. And one evening he went out to check on his employer's transmitter tower at the edge of town. <coughs> and he got out there and there was someone there picking up dead birds from the ground. This guy turned out to be an ornithologist named Richard Graber. He was studying birds who were killed by flying into the transmission tower. Bill Cochran was really intrigued by this, thought this was really cool, and pretty soon he was spending all of his spare time tinkering together gadgets to help Graber in his work. Sorry, my voice is going, but I'm going to try to finish up. So the first project that they worked on together, Bill Cochran and Richard Graber were actually the first people to record the sounds of the nocturnal flight calls of birds passing overhead. They wanted to be able to record a full eight hour night. And this was before digital recorders. So it was Cochran who figured out how to work, how to rig up a tape recorder with the 6,000 feet of tape to, with a bicycle axle to hold it all that they would need to record a full night of bird migration. <coughs> but as I said, the chapter in my book where Bill Cochran looms largest is the one on radio telemetry. And there were basically two major technological advances happening around this time that made radio telemetry for tracking wildlife really feasible. All telemetry means is just transmitting data collected in one location to another location. So the first of these was the invention of the transistor in 1947. Without getting too technical, before this, basically radios relied on vacuum tubes to amplify the signals that they were sending out. Vacuum tubes were really big and bulky and not very reliable, but the transistor offered a much more elegant and reliable and smaller way to do this, which meant that suddenly radios could be adapted for all kinds of things that they weren't very useful for before. And then a decade after the invention of the transistor in 1957 came the launch of Sputnik. And Sputnik touched off a whole new wave of interest in radios and what they could do. Because basically all Sputnik did was circle the earth and beep and anyone on earth with a radio could pick up the beep, beep, beep of this thing in space. And so suddenly everyone was like, this is amazing. How can we do this? So Bill Cochran at this point still had not finished that electrical engineering degree was working on it, still was working part-time doing some stuff for Richard Graber over at the Illinois Natural History Survey, but he was also really, really good with transistors. And soon he had picked up another part-time gig working for a radio astronomer at the University of Illinois, who was working on some radio beacons that were going to go up on some of the first US satellites that were being launched in response to Sputnik. It didn't take long before someone suggested combining uh, Cochrane's two part-time gigs. They said, gee, Bill, what would happen if you try putting one of your radio transmitters on a duck, it was like, I don't know, that's, I don't know, that sounds interesting, let's try it. So they sent a duck over from the field station to the satellite lab. Bill strapped a radio transmitter onto this thing with a metal band across its chest. And because of the way this metal band was distorted as the bird breathed in and out, when they released the duck, without really meaning to, they collected some of the very first data on the physiology of birds in flight because they could track its respiratory rate as it was flying. Bill Cochran was just 
fascinated by this. And this is what he spent the whole rest of his career doing was building, figuring out how to build better and better and better radio transmitters that could be worn by animals so that scientists could track their movements in the field. Some of his first projects involved um, building transmitters for rabbits. There were some scientists in the area who were figuring out better ways to survey the local cottontail rabbit population. But by 1965, he was building transmitters small enough that they could be placed on small songbirds. So his ornithologist buddy, Richard, or, yeah, Richard Graber, studied thrushes. And so in 1965, they captured a thrush in Illinois. They found a pilot who was willing to go up in a small plane to try and follow this bird when it took off on its migratory flight in the evening, because these transmitters only had a range of a few miles. So you had to stay within range of it. They trimmed some feathers off this bird's back. They stuck on a transmitter. It took off at dusk and Graber and a pilot went up in this plane. You can see all the antennas sticking out of the back of the plane. They called it the porcupine. <coughs> and they were able to follow this bird for 400 miles that night, 200 of which were over the open waters of Lake Michigan. And Graber was so awed by this experience that when he wrote about it later, he compared it to the feeling that he had uh, watching the coverage of the Apollo moon missions. They wouldn't have been able to see the bird. They were just sitting in a dark cockpit following the sound of this beep, beep, beep as the bird flew through the night ahead of them. So this was really cool. Bill Cochran, though, was just getting started. Everyone, every time, I feel like every time I give this talk, there's someone in the audience who knew Bill Cochran or worked with Bill Cochran, and I just keep hearing more and more and more Bill Cochran stories. So 1973, Bill Cochran catches another thrush in Illinois, this time he wasn't following it with a plane, he was following it in, a, in the station wagon that you can see here that had a hole cut in the top for the radio receiver. Cochran and a, and a young student who was acting as his driver were able to follow this bird in this vehicle for a week from Illinois all the way up across the Canadian border and into Manitoba. They had some wild adventures along the way. At one point in rural Minnesota, they got pulled over by a suspicious police officer because who wouldn't be suspicious of this thing driving through their little town and it was nighttime they were following the bird bill didn't want to lose the signal so he basically kicked the student who was with him out of the car to stay with the cop and sort things out kept on driving waited until the bird sat down at dawn doubled back picked up the student and they kept on going finally after they crossed into canada they had to give up when the engine of their vehicle gave out and they were able to stick with this bird for so long gathering data on its heading every evening when it took off, that they could see how its specific heading shifted slightly as the bird's position changed relative to magnetic north. So basically this work was some of the first real world evidence of birds navigating using the Earth's magnetic field, which was really cool. So I could, I could go on and on and on about Bill Cochran, but I won't because again, I want to leave some time for questions. Bill, um, I gather that Bill never really got the hang of the politics of academia. He was kind of a prickly dude, kind of hard to get along with. He never really got the hang of the peer review system for publishing scientific work. And by the 1990s, he had left his job with the Illinois Natural History Survey on what were maybe not the greatest terms, but he was still building transmitters for ornithologists in his garage right up into the beginning of this century. And I had the wonderful good fortune to speak with him a couple times while I was researching this book and to visit him at his home. And sadly, he passed away last year at the age of 90. And I'm just, I'm really happy that this book will hopefully bring some of his accomplishments to a wider audience. Okay, I've just got a couple more slides, I promise. So all three of these stories that I've told tonight, I chose these I chose historical stories intentionally because I didn't want to get into a situation where I was going to be talking about the work of someone who is in the audience listening because I've given this talk for some audiences of ornithologists. But if you do get a chance to read the book, it does, like I said, cover some of the more modern high tech recent advances like high volume genomic sequencing and teeny tiny tracking backpacks and stuff like that. These are allowing us to, get to gather better and better data on bird migration and better target conservation efforts to help these birds. And that's a really good thing because migratory birds are in trouble. I'm sure that a lot of you are already familiar with, with what was called the 3 billion birds paper that came out just a few years ago that found that there are about 3 billion fewer birds now, billion with a B in North America than there were in 1970, which is just staggering. So I don't wanna end on a, on a downer note though. So when I was research, when I was writing the conclusion of my book, I called up a couple of the 
leading thinkers in migratory bird conservation today, including Pete Mara, who's one of the authors on this paper and is continuing to work on some recovery efforts that have grown out of this. And we talked about how we still need to be collecting better data, like the time for data collection is not over. And we need to be getting better at sharing this data with the people who need it and working across international borders and stuff like that. But I asked Pete if he feels hopeful, like when he gets up and goes to work in the morning, does he feel optimistic that he's actually making a difference? And so I'm gonna conclude by reading just a little bit of what he said to me. He said, I'm very optimistic. We've done this in the past, we've corrected other environmental issues, and now we have to deal with climate change. So while it seems like there's this overwhelming deluge of negative issues and challenges with getting people on board with these things and constant pressures on nature, I choose to be optimistic and hopeful because I just don't see any benefit of being pessimistic or having a lack of hope. I just don't choose to take that route. Don't get me wrong, there are times when I might be negative or spiraling down into a pit of agony, but I'm not gonna do that. So I thought those were pretty wise words. And I don't know about all of you listening, but if I find myself spiraling down into a pit of agony, usually what I do is just go birding. So this is my website, RebeccaHeisman.com. I have some social media accounts, but I, as a lot of us do, I have a complicated relationship with social media. So if you're interested in my writing and my book and any other future projects, if you go to the website, you can sign up for my email list there. And that's probably the best way to stay in touch with me. So I think I wrapped up and with plenty of time for questions, I hope. Well, thank you, Rebecca. That was uh, supremely interesting. And uh, I, I, I liked your, your closing note there. And you know, one of the questions I had, no, I'm not going to give away the book. I have read the book. Um, <coughs> and I think it's, I think everyone should get it. Um, one of the things you, you sort of touch on this notion of purpose and, you know, when you feel depressed, you go up burning. Um, do you think birds give us a sense of purpose? Is that sort of a, an underlying theme maybe of this book? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Definitely, I know that for myself, I was already a birder before 2020 and COVID, but just speaking personally, I really found that spring of 2020 when there was so much turmoil happening both in the world with COVID and for me personally, watching migratory birds return that, that year and just keeping track of the birds that I saw over the course of, of the year was a real source of hope and I feel like the word distraction is almost trivializing it, but not just a distraction, but a reminder that like the, the bigger world was still going on out there, like bigger than my little problems that I was having. And yeah, I think a lot of the scientists that I talk to find a lot of purpose and a lot of hope in observing birds and working with birds and trying to make sure the birds are gonna be around for a long time. That's good. Um, I just wondered a couple of questions uh, that I had uh, also reading, reading through with, once again, without giving it away, um, what do you think is the common, because I mean, your book is really, it's about birds, but it's really about people too, right? I mean, you're yeah. you talking about the stories of people, which I found really interesting because it's not what I, I guess, of course, I'm, I'm sort of a bird nerd. I know a lot of our audiences, we, you know, we want to learn more about birds. And I found it was, it was really interesting how you, you, like birds were almost, I don't want to say the excuse, but they were the, the thing that held it all together. I mean, they were they're the, almost the background and you, you have this, this canvas, I guess you would say, with all these stories of people, little vignettes. And I found that very interesting how, um, well, first of all, obviously birds bring people together, but it's very much about people, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's not really a book about birds so much as it is about the people who study birds and how they do it and why they do it and the stuff that they found out. So yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And we have some uh, questions from the audience uh, I'd like to get to. Uh, Elena is asking, um, what would be the advantage of moon watching for bird migration over radar or other, met other methods of tracking birds? All right, so she's asking about the scientists who are trying to bring this back now. I'm not sure that there's a big advantage of bringing back moon watching over radar other than maybe there aren't weather radar stations in all areas. I live in the rural Western US and you'd be surprised there's a lot of the continent that's not very well covered by weather radar. I think the scientists who were working on that project to bring back and automate moon watching were partly just doing it for fun just to see if they could, but I think it would maybe have some applications for collecting data in places that aren't well covered by other methods. Interesting. And um, if I can for interject there, speaking of moon watching, one thing I found interesting with the book is, is sort of your, you're you're 
you present different technologies and different, um, yeah, I guess different techniques of tracking bird migration, how much are they sort of related to each other? Like how much does one thing evolve from something else? Is that something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are. So there are a lot of different approaches to studying bird migration. And I think a lot of them are very complementary because things like moon watching originally or now weather radar, you don't know what species you're looking at. You don't know what individual birds are doing. You're just kind of seeing these large scale patterns of when there are these giant movements going on. And then there are other technologies like these tiny tracking backpacks that let us see what one individual bird is doing when it flies to South America and back. And so there's a lot of powerful stuff going, just being done with kind of combining all of these different methods to get a better picture of what birds are doing. Like with weather radar, since they can't tell what individual birds are there, they've done a lot of work with pulling in citizen science data or community science data where they can look at eBird and see for the dates that they're studying with weather radar, what were the, the like the main sorts of birds that eBirders were seeing pass through at that time and kind of use that to extrapolate to what, what birds likely make up these big clouds that they're seeing on radar. So I think a lot of these technologies can work really well together. Does that answer your question? They, they're very complimentary. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, I think one of the other things that like I took away once again, without giving it away was like, the, there were a lot of spontaneous things you talk about um, radar being used for one purpose It's intended, it has an intended use, I guess. And even that, even then it might've been sort of an accidental thing that someone discovered, oh, we can track yeah. something with this technology. And then it almost gets repurposed. It's almost like something is useful, but let's now apply it to some, a question that we've always had about birds. That pretty much sums up the whole book is some cool development happened and it happens in some other field of science yeah. and ornithologists are like, ooh, how can we use this? Like the human genome project comes up in this book because it did not take long before ornithologists were, were borrowing the genetic sequencing techniques developed by the human genome project and putting them to use on birds or like the, the Sputnik and the invention of the transistor and like inspired bird research. Like the whole book is just something interesting happens in some other field of technology and ornithologists immediately steal it. Yeah. Yes. And I should point out that the last question from the audience from, from Elena, from Cole, her 11 year old son, obviously starting out uh, an, a strong interest in birds early. Um, Cole, Cole, yeah. Uh, Cole actually had another question. Do you know how much citizen scientists reporting birds on eBird helps track bird migration? Oh, a lot. So the lot, that's a great question. And the answer is a lot. It is not just busy work. The data that you submit to eBird is very, very, very useful. The entire last chapter of the book is about community science or citizen science. And about half of that chapter is devoted to eBird. And so I talked to the guys working at eBird and making use of this data. And basically every checklist that you submit to eBird goes into this massive data set that they're using to really drill down into like each little grid square on planet earth, like what birds are most likely to be at that spot for every date of the year. It, it's really cool what they're doing with eBird data. So yes, eBird is submitting complete checklists to eBird. You are hundred percent contributing to real migration science. I have an, an interesting um, question here from Roger. Roger's uh, making a comment about the common swift. The common swift is a, a species in, in the breeds in Europe. And he's saying that it almost immediately starts when, when a common swift fledges, it immediately starts an unaccompanied migration of thousands of miles, leaving its parents behind. Even with built-in orientation abilities, does anyone have any idea how it learns the actual navigation involved? That's a really good question. It's not something that I really get into in the book, I have to admit, but I'm not sure that anyone really knows for sure how birds that migrate you know, by themselves as opposed to in a flock with family members or something, how they do it the first time. Obviously, there's a lot of genetic hardwiring at play, but we also know that birds have a lot of different ways of navigating. So it, it would be really interesting to be inside the mind of a bird as it does that for the first time and kind of figures it out. Yeah. And, and that, that that's a, sort of a, a, a great question that brings the, the notion of mystery in bird migration. I think, yeah. I, I, think I don't know about, about you, but I mean, we're, we all, I think we're, we're all captured by the mystery of migration, how the birds know where, know where they're going. Were you ever at any point in writing this book concerned that you would lose your sense of awe about migration, that in, you know, learning so much about the, the, the backstories or some of the details that you would lose that? No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that ever even occurred to me. The more 
you know, all the stories about scientists in this book just go to, and like how it just goes, the study of migration just goes on and on and on, and people are still working on it today. It just goes to show you that it's one of those subjects where the more we learn about it, the more questions we have about it. So I don't, I don't think there's any danger of losing your sense of awe about bird migration just because you know a lot about it. Yeah. That's interesting. Nancy's asking a question. Were you able to speak to any indigenous knowledge keepers about migration? I did not. And that is something that has been on my mind. Um, and when I, I mentioned talking to Pete Mara and, then, and another expert on bird migration, and they both talked about wanting to incorporate more indigenous perspectives, even into the, even into the basic research that's going on. But sadly, the answer is no, I did not talk to any indigenous people. I I, I, and I, I'm very much aware of the fact that all three of the people that I talked about in this presentation were white dudes. Um, I do wanna say that if you get a chance to, part of that is that I was telling historical stories and if you get a chance to read the book, there's some really cool women and people of color in there and some of the more recent research, but it's still true that ornithology is really white and male dominated. And yeah, I don't really have a good answer other than no, and I thought about it, but I couldn't really figure out a good way to incorporate that. And it's something that's been on my mind. Yeah. I think one thing that uh, struck me sort of along those lines is what you want to call the diversification of bird science yeah. is in, in, in sort of um, tracking the course of, migra of migra migration research, you start going, you know, you start in North America and you start kind of going a little bit farther afield and then you start seeing these collaborations internationally, um, you know, people in South America collaborating with people in North America, because I guess the thing is really all the we're all connected by these birds that are moving across from one continent to another, aren't we? Yeah, and I really made an effort to not make this book all just about, again, like white people in North America. And so if you read the book, there's, yeah, some really cool folks in Colombia and also in Asia. There were a couple situations where I was talking to someone in the UK about work that they had done in Asia and started, and started asking like, okay, but who were your local collaborators? Like, who were you working with there? And that led me to like a really cool Mongolian ornithologist who I got to interview over Zoom and some things like that. So it was, a really, it was really fun connecting with these people all over the world. Indeed, and you can find more of those stories in, in this book, uh, Flight Pass. Uh, Lori is actually asking the question, uh, where can your book be found? Amazon chapters? <laughs> I think I think the answer is th this book can be found uh, in all uh, places where uh, great books are sold. Uh, probably both of those places, Lori. Um, do you have any comments about that as well, Rebecca? Yeah, you can find that on Amazon. I, I encourage people who have an independent local bookstore to buy it there. But yeah, you, I think the stock answer is you can find it wherever books are sold. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask you one sort of closing question, if you will, unless yeah. there's any further audience questions. What was the one thing that surprised you most about that you learned about bird migration by writing this book? Ooh, I don't know if I can pick just one thing. That's a uh -huh. really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Gosh. Um... You know, I, this isn't something that I learned writing the book because I was already aware of this, but the thing that I keep coming back to is the bar-tailed godwits that make the nonstop flight from Alaska to New Zealand because it's just mind boggling to me that a bird and, and not a bird that's built for swimming, like it's a shore bird, but it's not a bird that could, that could handle being on the open ocean, that there's a bird that takes off from Alaska and spends, I forget how long, I think it's almost a week flying across the Pacific Ocean and its feet don't touch land or water again until it touches down in New Zealand. Like that is just amazing. And the reason it's possible is because there are prevailing winds in the fall that give it a really good head start blowing it out of Alaska, but it's still just, it's still just, yeah, mind boggling. Excellent, thank you. And I do want to, to um, reveal, we have two winners, two lucky winners in our uh, live audience here of the two Yay. puppies. They're, they're, they're right here. The winners are uh, Angelique Davies and Leanne Gillis. I believe we have your uh, mailing information and we will send those books to you. Um, I would like to thank you very much, Rebecca, for uh, a great <coughs> taster of your book. And I say taster because we don't want to give it too much away because there is so much in here. 
And it's one of those books, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just the type person, I'm like, oh, you read, you know, chapter one, one day, chapter two. And then you start, you know, like, no, I have to keep reading because, <laughs> because like, you can't just stop there. It's like birding. It's like being on the field. Like, you can't just uh, stop. So um, I encourage uh, all of you to check out this book at your local um, bookstore. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for, uh, for, Coming to speaking, uh, coming to speak to us here at the Toronto Birth Celebration for our audience yes. stretching across North America, and I wish you and I wish all of our audience a very happy spring migration. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good night, everyone.